Our next speaker is going to talk to us on the status, the strategic direction and innovations in mental health in the New Zealand Defence Force, uh, Colonel Claire Bennett. Uh, Colonel Bennett joined the New Zealand Defence Force Regular Force as a commissioned officer and psychiatrist, psychologist, my apologies, in 1987. She served for 20 years in a variety of operational research and policy roles, more lately as the Director of Military Personnel Policy and Director of Strategic Human Resources. During this time, she's also held a number of representational roles, including as the New Zealand National Representative on the HUM Group, the Technical Cooperation Panel. She is a graduate of the New Zealand Defence Force Command and Staff College, holds master's degrees in business and strategy, and in 2003 was made a member of the New Zealand Order of Merit. She transferred to the reserves in 2007 to work in broader government roles before returning to the regular force in December of 2016 to take up the role of Chief Mental Health Officer in the Directorate of Health of the New Zealand Defence Force. Ladies and gentlemen, Colonel Bennett. Thank okay. you. <coughs> okay. So, uh, first of all, I'd just like to thank the organising committee and uh, Tony in particular um, from the Stand Tall group for the opportunity to be here. Uh, certainly from my perspective, uh, you'll notice my Kiwi accent, sorry, I'm even noticing it myself. Uh, certainly from my perspective, um, the opportunity to learn about um, current practice, evidence-based treatments and so forth is hugely beneficial. Um, I also would like to echo uh, Dr Asano's comments yesterday about the fantastic proactive approach that Australia is taking in terms of how it deals with and approaches mental health and uh, post-trauma stress. Um, I think from a, uh, as, uh, as the comment has already been made from a government perspective, from a senior leadership perspective, from organisations that are working closely together to make a difference, I think absolutely to be commended. I would also like to acknowledge the work that our ADF and Department of Veterans Affairs are doing and the support that they've provided to the New Zealand Defence Force. We're a very small organisation and couldn't achieve what we have been able to without their support, so um, certainly important from our perspective, thank you. Uh, the other thing I wanted to do was, um, so this, uh, we, We've certainly found the value in shared stories and I know many people have shared them over the duration of the last couple of days and again absolutely to be commended. This is uh, actually my story. Uh, this is about my husband who um, served 23 years in the military. Uh, he got out after a very successful career having deployed operationally several times including commanding a, ba a battalion in East Timor to find uh, he bounced out into a second successful career and then about two years later had a war. And I think we can't underestimate the impact that um, deployment experiences can have on our deployed people, our service people, uh, and the families that support them. So just a bit of context, uh, first of all, for those of you who don't know much about the Defence Force, we are very small. Uh, we have 9,000 uniformed personnel uh, supported by around 2,000 civilians and 2,000 reserves. We also have around about 30,000 people in our veteran population, um, or well, in excess of. We've got a very um, constrained definition of, of a veteran, so uh, unlike the Australian policy where uh, day one in service now, you're actually entitled to benefits, uh, it's a very restricted um, list of operations uh, that people are deployed on that are actually they're entitled to veteran support. So that's really problematic from our perspective. We have had, we've got around about 270 PERS that are currently deployed operationally uh, to a range of missions in eight countries. Historically, uh, we've supported a range of missions, including at one time, along with Australia, we had 1,000 uh, uh, force in, in East Timor. So for, for our size, our commitment has been reasonably significant. How we support our people because we're so um, small in comparison is that uh, we provide a, a focus on prevention, uh, early intervention, screening and then referring people outside the organisation for help. So uh, our relationship with third party providers is critical and understanding the effectiveness of treatment modalities. Uh, for civilians we have EIP support programmes and we have Veterans Affairs uh, and ACC uh, for those that have no other uh, course of access. 
that can be challenging for us because many of our serving people when they retire or leave the organisation, their only access is to uh, mental health services in the broader community. We know as a reflection of the broader demographic, I'm sure these stats are quite similar to the Australian ones in terms of around about 50% of people will experience either some kind of mental health related disorder or a uh, substance misuse in their lifetime, uh, one in five each year. Um, we also know uh, family violence is around about uh, in one in every seven households uh, and one in five um, people who drink have um, some kind of problem drinking issues. In New Zealand we have one in nine adult New Zealanders who are on antidepressant medication. There's been a lot of uh, interest in mental health recently. Uh, certainly suggesting that it's not being done well in New Zealand. So when we are um, encouraging our people out to be supported in this environment, it uh, creates some challenges. Uh, we have around about um, a third of people, just over a third of people that actually uh, need help that um, will approach and get help in any one year. So that means there are a lot of people uh, who are at risk who are not getting help. In New Zealand, so um, just probably two weeks ago, the coroner's uh, uh, report um, provided um, the latest uh, findings in, in terms of suicide deaths in 2016. So we now lead again the OECD countries in youth suicide. The government has just invested $224 million over four years. I'm certainly very jealous of the investment that's made in Australia in mental health. So, if we're thinking about mental health in the New Zealand Defence Force, we can think, you know, that probably similar patterns to the broader demographic. Uh, we do, however, screen out um, significant mental health disorders where these are declared. Uh, we are generally younger and fitter, but we're also more uh, highly represented in some of those at-risk groups being uh, young Māori and Pacific, Pacific Islanders. And also, as David talked about very well yesterday, the nature of the, the demands of the role in terms of both potential deployment stresses and non-deployment stresses. So our people have that complex uh, combination of both over their, their careers. We also know that um, some people are seeking help outside the organisation. Sorry, I didn't mention that before. So what we do know about the mental health status of our people from medical and counter information, we have about 5% of people a year that uh, are seeking help for um, stress, depression and sleep related issues. Uh, PTSD, substance, uh, suicide and substance misuse uh, and family violence are lower than reported in the broader demographic. Uh, however, uh, certainly we, our feeling is that um, areas like family violence are underreported. Our veterans, we have 3,300 who are uh, active cases um, signed up with um, Veterans Affairs. Uh, around about, I believe, half of those are mental health related. We have a very small number of contemporary veterans who are signed up uh, from Afghanistan and East Timor mainly, and they are um, showing uh, high indications of PTS. We did some research recently looking at uh, reported stresses over the previous four weeks, and you'll see the list on the left there um, in um, approximate um, um, significance in terms of the number of times that they were reported to be a problem, uh, quite a lot or to a great degree. When you look at that list, you'll see it is a combination of perhaps occupational stresses and general life stresses. We're using Tafari Tapafar as a, a model of health that reinforces the importance of the four domains of health, uh, mental, physical, spiritual, and far now social. We've also looked at the relationship between life stresses and psychological distress. And what we found is that loneliness, sleep, and an experience of a previous disorder are the best predictors of psychological distress, or there's the strongest relationship between those things. And I think that's consistent with what, what's been reported earlier uh, uh, in this uh, forum as well. Also linked, but uh, um, slightly less strongly, are job satisfaction, conflict with others, finances and relationships. And finally, also um, showing a relationship, are uh, alcohol use, concerns about workload, and uh, health. 
We found um, those with chronic pain, uh, that was the biggest predictor of um, linkage with uh, psychological distress. Found similar relationships for psychological distress and uh, stress disorder. We found that um, there was a fairly similar rate between our civilians and our military and uh, consistent with previous research that actually our deployed people have lower levels of psychological distress than our non-deployed people. We've done a little bit of looking at uh, moral injury and um, these, this is an order of um, the um, impact that um, experiencing those things had on um, psychological well-being. So I think it does reinforce that actually um, there is, uh, particularly for our forces, we have uh, people that are deployed, um, not part of a form group, they're often on very isolated missions, they're in roles where their, their, um, their, their mandate is to observe and re record and report rather than intervene. So that creates a lot of challenges for people in many of the um, uh, operational deployments, uh, for example, in Sudan at the moment. We also found a range of protective factors, and uh, I think they're similar to um, what was reported um, yesterday as well. And when it comes to help seeking, we found similar results to, again, what has been reported, uh, a preference to manage issues uh, 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 by people themselves, and that's really reinforced by our culture, um, where um, we are teaching our people from day one to be tough, to, um, to uh, not be weak and uh, need help. So it's very difficult for people to feel that it's okay to ask for help. We do find that, um, consistent with previous research, that um, when levels of distress increase or well-being uh, decrease, then uh, people are less likely to seek help. The main concern for military people was concerns about career impacts, uh, whether they are deployed uh, and their future in the organisation. And a significant percentage of our people said they'd only go outside the organisation for help. So what do we do with that? So two years ago, we started developing our mental health strategy. Uh, as you'll see there, so reinforcing the four domains of Tafara Tapafa, uh, also reinforcing the relationship between the individual at the centre, uh, the relationship with command and with our health professionals and our third party providers. Also the focus on prevention as well as management of um, mental health issues. They're the priorities uh, that we identified at the time. I think they're, again, very consistent with um, other presentations and approaches across organisations, being able to focus on prevention, mitigate areas of risk, and ensure that people get the help that they need early on. Uh, the um, point around transition, I think there's been a lot of discussion around transition, uh, and I think that sort of reinforces as our veterans are transferring outside the organisation, we may need to prepare them to uh, strive and be successful. Governance and leadership is also really critical. Without that, I don't believe that we'll be successful. So when we rolled out the strategy, we had four themes around lead, understand, prepare and care. Lead, obviously, around government, governance and coordination. The leader's role in creating the culture and environment where people feel safe to be able to ask for help. Uh, our leaders actually manage their people well make sure that some of those stresses that people encounter, that um, the early recognition of those and supported to get the help that they need. Policies are also important without those and clear guidelines around how we manage information, what happens to people when they ask for help, etc. cetera. Um, that is also part of the puzzle. And the, the messages around, so stigma and barriers to care are, are very much alive and well. So how do we actually change that? We need to get positive messages out there, but we also need to put our money where our mouth is in terms of making sure that those that do put their hand up for help are supported and um, um, strive and are successful going forward. Measurement and reporting is really important, as is the research. Uh, one of our big gaps is longitudinal research. We don't know how our people are going over time, and that includes our veterans. We've um, 
spent a lot of time putting the foundations in place. We didn't have a lot, even in terms of um, resources, resources for our leaders, um, just general pocketbook, uh, handy tools that uh, our people can access, useful websites, useful phone apps, um, things that uh, people can actually go and find the information that, that, that they need. Um, as I said before, people want to be in control, so let's help them be in control, let's help them get the right information that they need to make the right decisions and recognise when they need help. The last one is around care and um, one of our challenges historically is we've had some, some um, very good resources across the organisation. We have doctors, we have psychologists, we have chaplains, we've now got social workers and we've got a range of other people that, um, medics and nurses and so forth, that provide elements of support to our people when they're not going okay. The challenge is, however, historically it hasn't been well joined up. We also haven't really monitor the relationship that we have with the third party providers to make sure that the treatment modalities that they're using are actually consistent with best practice. So we need to get smarter at that as well. We also need to ensure that the way that we work with Veterans Affairs going forward is much more joined up, that we uh, can provide that soft handover for our veterans. A lot of our young veterans don't even see themselves as, as veterans, um, and that's probably been reinforced a little bit by the, the old culture in the RSAs and so forth. But we are actually really doing a lot of work in that space now to change that. This is a mental health continuum. I'm not sure if you've seen it before. I suspect you've seen a version of it. Um, it was developed in the US military initially. Uh, it was um, further developed uh, through the Canadian uh, Road to Mental Re Readiness Program. And I also know that um, the Australian Defence Force is using it in some form as well. We've found this really helpful in helping people to um, get around some of the stigma of mental illness. Um, messages to people is that Depending on what is going on in your life, we're all going to be sitting at some place on this continuum. And mental health is going to impact on our physical health, it's going to impact on our behaviour, it's going to impact on how we think and how we feel. Hopefully I'll press the right one. Oh, that wasn't the right one, sorry. So, what we say to people is that Wherever they are at a point in time, they can, they can change. And depending on where they are at a point in time, like often people will be a little bit in the yellow zone where they're having difficulty sleeping, they may have low energy, they may have uh, muscle, muscle tension or headaches, um, they may be feeling um, sad or overwhelmed, and they may be drinking a bit more and gambling and so forth. So here we'd be encouraging them to, to take breaks, recognise their limits, um, leverage some of those protective factors, um, the ones I mentioned before, the one that we found the most significant relationship were around sleep, uh, diet uh, and, health, and exercise. So vigorous and moderate exercise and sleep were found to be the most important protective factors. We're saying to people when they're here, perhaps it's time to seek additional support uh, and here definitely to follow care recommendations and know what resources are available and how to access them. That's taken some of the stigma around mental health away. Um, sorry, I'm just um, thinking about what I'm going to say next. Uh, so, our doctors are using it. Um, we're finding now actually it's getting out in the community and um, our soldiers are really connecting with it. We've also introduced the Integrated Wellness Program and this is important. Pardon me. This is reinforcing the importance of creating that life cycle approach from creating a sense of belonging. Uh, that's for our families as well as our serving people. It's around how we offer the programs that keep them well. And that may be a range of programs around, um, for, particularly for our young people, um, some general life skills, because maybe they haven't got those in place when they joined the organisation. It's around financial management, it's around relationship management. And if we think back to what some of the issues were that people were having uh, problems with, actually a lot of this is around general life stresses and uh, things that can develop into longer term issues if uh, people don't get the support that they need. So then the care and support and transition. We've done a bit of work in the transition space. Um, 
We've been using David Rock's model uh, of the SCARF model around change to help people uh, better understand actually what they may experience when they transition. And we're starting to improve our programs. Historically, we only offered transition support that those people that have been in the organisation for 12 or so years. Um, there's a lot of people that aren't in the organisation for 12 years that still have difficulties transitioning. So that's where we've been putting some of our effort going um, uh, lately and uh, recognising, I think, like everybody, the importance of continuing to focus on transition. The last, um, <coughs> excuse me, thing I'll talk about is um, Veterans Affairs. Um, we've got a new um, Head of Veterans Affairs, and uh, Bernadine McKenzie, and she's doing a fantastic job at rethinking actually our approach for veterans. So you'll see here that it's much more collaborative, it's much more involving our veterans in the process. It's making sure that they've got access to the right services at the right time, and making sure that it is a tra seamless transition. Our continuing priorities are on maintaining that focus on pre prevention, uh, ensuring that we strengthen the protective factors that um, around um, social support and creating the right culture and environment and good leadership. It's around mitigating those areas of risk. Um, obviously exposure to trauma is one, um, but it's exposure to other life stresses as well. Uh, we know that uh, isolation can have a, a significant impact um, linked to loneliness. So we need to ensure as an organisation what we're doing to um, either support um, that sense of community um, or what we may be doing that actually is eroding it. We also need to look at tempo to make sure that uh, people's workload is appropriate and so forth. We need to address the stigma and barriers to care. We, that is, I think, uh, one of the challenges for us as organisations. Um, and without doing that, uh, we need to make sure that there are opportunities for people to get the help they need outside of the organisation uh, in confidence, which we, we are doing. We have an 0800 number now where people can access up to three sessions. It's certainly not um, at the same level as the services provided by VVCS, but it is at least something. We're also looking at screening and monitoring. I uh, mentioned before about the importance of longitudinal re uh, research and tracking people how they're going over time. The other thing that we're rolling out at the moment is a positively uh, focused health program where we're providing um, groups with uh, better feedback about how they're going um, across those four domains and giving them to access to tools and uh, resources. Uh, so this includes a physiological health screen as well as a psychosocial health screen. So we're, we're trialling that and uh, we're going to do a three month follow up and uh, 12 month to see whether those changes, if we do get changes, are sustained. We're also continuing, as I mentioned before, to focus on transition support and access to quality care. So just in summing up, I think um, there's been a really strong theme across the, um, the forum over the last couple of days around how we enable veterans to be well, independent and at their best. And that's certainly the focus of uh, what we, the work that we've been doing in a much more joined up approach with Veterans Affairs, with the RSA. Uh, we have our Overwatch equivalent group in New Zealand now called NODAF and, um, and NZDF. So we are working together. Uh, for those who were at the dinner uh, last night, this may make some sense. For those of you who weren't, it will probably make no sense. So really, we're thinking about how we can bring the three little pigs together to keep the foray intact uh, so that the big bad wolf doesn't come along. Or if he does, that um, we keep our people safe and protected. So it does need to be a partnership and we do need to work together. Thank you very much.